This is the Voice of Russia in London. My name is Dmitry Linnik. Now, U.S. claim to global dominance. That's broadly the topic of today's discussion, in which I'm joined by Mardi Darius Nezemroaya, research associate at the Center for Research on Globalization down the line from Canada, Jonathan Steele of The Guardian newspaper and author of several books, James Thackera, novelist and human rights activist, and Dr. Anatole Levin, visiting professor, Department of War Studies at King's College London, down the line from Qatar. Thank you for joining me for this discussion. In his recent address to the United Nations, President Obama said of the United States of America, We are heirs to a proud legacy of freedom, and we are prepared to do what is necessary to secure that legacy for generations to come. Join us in this common mission for today's children and tomorrow's. That's an invitation to the rest of the world to follow the United States. He used the word America 27 times in a fairly short speech that included only two references to the United States of America. So he thinks of himself, of his country, as a continent or of the globe. So what sort of claim does America have to global domination? If I could start with you, Mardi, from Canada. Well, I think the United States has no claim to global domination. Of course, that's not the same in practice. It's done everything uh, it can in its power to uh, impose itself globally. But, I mean, if you're talking about a claim to global domination, it has no legal claim has no moral claim it has no claim whatsoever that what he was saying is basically uh, uh poetry uh, of course he's he can say america as much as he wants or the united states of america and I, i'd like to point something out since i'm from this hemisphere the western hemisphere and the united states uh, is to the south of uh, us in canada the majority of our brethren in south america and latin america get very offended not offended they get touchy when the United States refers to itself as America, they say we're also Americans. America is this entire continent, or two continents, South America and North America. So they're very touchy to point out that the United States of America is not America. And the United States does uh, many times lose sight of the fact that when it talks, it can only talk for itself. It's not supposed to be talking for the rest of the world. In fact, it appropriates terms like international community, and it actually increasingly mingles the two. It loses sight of where the international community is in the United States. Is James Thackeray, you are a self-confessed Obama apologist. Um, um, cheerleader, they say on the BBC. <laughs> you wouldn't go that far. Increasingly, you have to apologize yeah. for Obama more often than out. So apologies well, I, in I that sense? I don't feel any apology uh, for Obama. I, I think everybody should be worrying about what would have happened if he hadn't been in office. I mean, it was a great speech in the UN. Unfortunately, America doesn't follow its own precepts. And the speech, part of the speech, which I read very carefully, the whole world to adopt this speech as its credo it wouldn't necessarily mean that they belong to an American empire. They might just do things in the American way, which is something Americans hugely believe in. He talked about might not right and right not might in that. And I thought that that was, and I'm sure Jonathan will rush to agree with me on this, uh, gross hypocrisy. We've just been through a very ugly period in which uh, America exerted might not right. And a lot of people have died. And that's been true of Vietnam and Korea before that. So uh, we have a really big foreign policy problem. When one says American dominance and American way of life, you're actually talking about a country that's withdrawn from the world. American Revolution was about withdrawing from the world. It wasn't about dominating the world. It's done a hell of a bad job of influencing anybody in the world. I mean, I think Stalin would have been rather grateful to America for helping liberate him from the Nazi assault, which he didn't do single-handedly, obviously. America, rather. But Obama has uh, given the limit. I mean, Putin has been able to concentrate in his hands and create, and probably as he would have liked to, a personality cult around himself. And when you have that amount of power, he's moved very deftly in Ukraine. It's been a spectacular performance. And in fact, uh, we've kind of conceded. I mean, I think that Crimea and East Ukraine are effectively conceded. And uh, Obama's already backing away from sanctions. Uh, Merkel has basically taken control there. America doesn't have uh, anybody like Putin. We have an elected official who's got very little power. 
And he came in on dreams, and I'm glad you say poetry because he certainly has a lot of poetry. I thought it was a great speech, and uh, interestingly, okay, I thought concept. he agreed. I thought he agreed with Lavrov. Okay, Lavrov attacked uh, Lavrov us quite. Lavrov didn't seem to think so. No, no, no. I think if you examine the foreign policy aspect of what they were saying, I think they were both talking as responsible people. Obama avoided foreign policy. That was, in fact, a stump speech for the midterm elections he gave. He was trying to present himself and you know sending Biden to Ukraine's part of all of that. Obama has managed to survive. Uh, Carter and Clinton were destroyed by the Republicans. Uh, Obama keeps a very, very he keeps his cards very close. And uh, I don't think that speech gave away a great deal. I agree that it was poetry, and I don't think it was a harmful speech. America certainly is in a position of gross hypocrisy in terms of the exerting of power. Well, it's the idea of U.S. dominance and U.S. claim to global dominance, world leadership, that I want to sort of go back to, can, can, uh, away from the tactics of midterm elections and Putin's, that? you know, a stake in Crimea and all of that. So we'll, we'll get back to that. If Let me just add, add a corollary to that. Right at the beginning of Obama, Gary Wills was in the New York Review of Books saying, let's be grateful for this remarkable person who's been president, but don't expect anything of him. From the War Powers Act in 1941, the American security establishment has been building up its presence in the world. We now have a thousand bases abroad in 120 countries. If he had 36 years in office, he could not dismember this monster. Obama certainly does, is not unaware that the monster is there, uh, from, and we should all be collaborating to get rid of that monster. Okay, Jonathan Steele in the studio here. In the time of the Obama presidency, the U.S. military presence uh, around the world has increased quite substantially and is now counted at 134 countries, is the latest figure from the Pentagon. From the Pentagon. Oh. James, don't look at me. No, it's I'm, the Pentagon. I'm, I'm grateful for the information. Right. Um, okay. I got 120 so, from Chomsky. Uh, of course, it's, um, you know, from full-scale military bases to a group of some sort of, you know, uh, special forces or whatever, advisors. But anyway, it's military presence in 134 countries. So isn't that domination? No, it's not domination. It's an attempt at domination, maybe. I mean, I think that speech was made to the UN General Assembly. It's he was speaking to the world as it was, were, but I think he was speaking down to the world. It was a very patronizing speech to talk constantly about American leadership and the beacon on the hill and all that and the hope of freedom, etc., etc. I mean, but this is the strand that's long been there in American history, is this exceptionalism that somehow, unlike any other country, it's not motivated by self-interest or any cynical things, but it's, the, you know, bringing freedom and democracy and the rule of law to the rest of the world. And I, it was very interesting that Putin picked up that up in his famous op-ed piece in the New York Times some months ago, criticizing this American exceptionalism, saying we've had enough of it. And I think uh, Obama, unfortunately, has been very hypocritical because when he came in we thought that he would respect the UN much more than Bush had done because with all Bush's preemptive wars and unilateralism and so on but actually Obama's hardly brought the UN into the mix at all. Look at this latest thing against ISIS. This was a classic case where you would want a UN Security Council resolution to and it decide wouldn't have what been to too do. Difficult, right? And it wouldn't have been too difficult but instead of that he just announces we're having a coalition of the willing, we're going to be the leaders of it etc etc so unfortunately he has been very much in the same mould of previous American presidents in spite of the election rhetoric when he came in in 2008. And it's all even down the line from Qatar. In your book, America Right and Wrong, An Anatomy of American Nationalism, you sort of juxtapose two faces, as it were, of the United States, its foreign policy in particular. On the one hand, commitment to democracy, liberal values, amazing enterprise, resourcefulness, and all of those positive things. On the other, extreme nationalism, isolationism, fear of any real or imagined threat. So which America are we seeing more of? I think both. It's important to note, though, that both sides of it are nationalist. The belief in America's right and duty to, to lead the world towards democracy is just as, as nationalist in its way as that of the, you know, the hardline chauvinists who basically hate the rest of the world. It's, it's two faces. Uh, of the same nationalism. What I think one certainly sees, however, in America today, compared to under George Bush, is much less desire to become involved in overseas adventures on the ground. And while Obama has shown that he is completely part of the, of the US establishment, and the whole of the establishment, Democrat as well as Republican, believes in American global 
leadership, as they would would call it. Uh, There are tactical differences. And um, Obama, of course, came in with a much more cautious agenda than George Bush, um, much more realist in a way. Some people have called him an Eisenhower Republican. But I think, you know, what we're seeing is, uh, is two things. One is that even a much more cautious U.S. president is both determined to maintain U.S. dominance in various parts of the world and is almost c- cannot phrase that um, to the American people, possibly can't even imagine it, uh, except in these tremendously magniloquent and ideological terms of, you, you know, leading democracy, leading freedom, and so forth and so on, which frankly, on the ground in the Middle East, nobody believes in. It's a separate issue whether it is or is not a good thing to fight against ISIS in Iraq and Syria, but this is most certainly not um, America leading democracy. Uh, Mark D, on the line from Canada, you're saying that there's, uh, the U.S. has no claim to global dominance, but the counter-argument would probably be that, look, for instance, at Eastern Europe. Those countries are happy to join this Western family of nations. They're happy to join NATO, which you accuse of being, of substituting um, the United Nations in your writing, in your book. And um, don't you grant the people of Eastern Europe a right to choose America for themselves? Well, I think that's a very good uh, question. But uh, from my experience in Eastern Europe, is not that Eastern Europeans want to have American leadership at, at all. You're talking about something that Europe, uh, Eastern European political elites, financial elites are interested in, not something that the regular people in Eastern Europe, in places like Bulgaria, where they're more concerned about bread on the table, an end to corruption. As far as people in Bulgaria or Romania are concerned, is uh, their states have been criminalized. The mafia is basically ru- involved in government there. Those are their concerns, not being part of some some uh, but, uh, American uh, empire. Sorry, Madi, but on the other hand, there's the successful example of Poland, for instance, which is being put up, isn't there? Well, you know, you can say we can say successful, but that successful is something in the eyes of uh, is something that it's in the eyes of the beholder. There's different definitions of successful. Kosovo has also been called a success story, which has the highest suicide rates in Europe after the United States and NATO took over. You know, if you ask a Kosovo or Albanian, they'll say we own nothing in our own country. I mean, if you want to call success uh, having all your uh, local resources or or the major corporations there being gutted or taken over by uh, people in, in Washington or Berlin or Paris or London, I mean, you can call that, that that's your definition definition of success, but in my view of uh, the definition of success, it 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 would diverge with that. And my experience in Eastern Europe, being there, speaking to people in Eastern Europe, seeing things as they are, is that a lot of them are actually uh, having second questions about what entry into the European Union, into being part of the Euro-Atlantic orbit, as some people in Brussels and and Washington like to call it. They have questions about this. Now, I want to go back on something, too. Like this talk about America being a beacon of freedom, helping spread democracy and stuff, this is just ideological framework to basically justify American foreign policy abroad. You know, during colonial periods, Western Europe, there was the white man's burden. You know, there was the mission of civilizing the world. And today, the United States has a mission of spreading democracy. But in practice, the proof is in the pudding. You can see that the United States has been one of the biggest obstructions to democracy in the Middle East, supporting the House of Saud in Saudi Arabia, the Al Khalifa family in Bahrain, which uses tanks against peaceful pr- protesters. In fact, I, one prominent protester from Bahrain, a very uh, brave woman, in the United States, she came and she said that when Mr. Obama said anywhere where people chant for freedom, they'll find a friend in the United States, but no friend in the United States was found. The United States didn't even say a word. So that's, that's, that's how they're spreading democracy. They've actually obstructed democracy. James, now this, um, the balls in your court, um, as a one-liner, the justification for this claim of the United States to global dominance, to global leadership, is that we are a force for good. Now, is it? I don't, I I mean, I think you're talking about the institution of the security apparatus we've got in America. I don't think that 
Obama created it. I'm not saying that to defend Obama. Obama's election mandate, I would go a little further than Anatole and say he was given a rather large, not so moderate one, which was basically to contain America. The people of America, as you say, wanted to withdraw from the world, and that was what he came in on. I don't think that the drone campaign, I mean, if I worked in nuclear weapons my entire life, um, I represented uh, Index on Censorship in Israel with the Atomic Bomb Project. I worked for 18 years doing Soviet period with Zamistad. You know, and I've watched many, many phases of the America abroad. And I've never heard anybody talk about American dominance, Dimitri. Forgive me for saying that. Um, I, I think American influence is the, the word might be needed. I mean, and that was probably what he was trying to emphasize in that speech about might for right and right for might. I don't think America wishes to dominate the world. But since it's never developed a foreign policy, I think its idea of its utopian prescription, which I agree with Mahdi, has not worked very well. We've got the largest prison population in the world. Um, I mean, I lived through the desaparecidos in Latin America and America's role abroad, and particularly with the Kennedy Doctrine in Vietnam. We, these were really aberrant, malfunctioning forms of governance. And uh, they were forms of governance. And in that sense, yes, America probably does exert a dominating influence, but I don't think its dominance is the idea of building a, an American empire, because that would never work. We haven't even been able to run our own country correctly. Well, that's something, Anatole Levin, you've touched upon in your book there, this empire building. Do you agree with what James has just said? Well, I mean, there's obviously a very strong current in the American establishment, which certainly does desire dominance and sometimes is willing to talk explicitly of empire. If you look at um, some of the neoconservatives and the, the program of Rumsfeld and Cheney during the last U.S. administration, I mean, the, the, this is a very powerful element in the, um, you know, in the U.S. establishment. And, of course, America didn't, um, as you might say, develop all these... Uh, these bases and these client regimes all over the world by accident. You know, there, there was a, a program there. Uh, but um, what I think is quite right is that this is by no means necessarily the will of the American people as a whole. It's often necessary, you know, precisely to whip up a, a completely exaggerated hysteria over international threats in order to get Americans, really, to, 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 to want to do anything much at all. I mean, that, that has been the history of several episodes in U.S. foreign policy. But just to, to come back on what Mahdi says, I mean, it's, um, it's true, no doubt, that in most parts of the world, most ordinary people are really just, you know, concerned with jobs and income and security and so forth. But foreign policy is shaped by foreign policy elites. And though or, if you like, simply those parts of the population that are interested in foreign policy. And if you look at Eastern Europe, and I have to say, I mean, I, I have been a strong critic of U.S. policy in Ukraine, but clearly there are a great many Ukrainians who do look to the U.S. for, for help and leadership. As for partly similar reasons, there are, of course, so many people in the Far East who look to the U.S., for help against China, because their fear of China is greater. And that includes, of course, the Vietnamese, who suffered so terribly at America's hands. Um, and in the Middle East, of course, there are a great many people who look to the US for help, also against neighbors of whom they are, uh, they are extremely frightened. They may not like um, asking or needing US help in this way, um, but they do ask for it. That isn't, however, by any manner of means necessarily in the name of democracy, as one can see in the Far East from the Vietnamese case, as in one can see in the Middle East from the Saudi case, and so on. But, I mean, you know, U.S. dominance would be going too far, but certainly, should we say, predominant influence in certain parts of the world is not simply imposed by imperial force. It is also desired by uh, a good many people in these in these areas. Jonathan Steele, has that been your impression? And actually, the people that desire, that invite this American involvement, are they getting it? Are they getting out of it what they desire? Well, I would very much uh, actually disagree on this occasion with uh, Anatole. I don't think the Middle East is the area where many people want the US protection or friendship or help. Uh, it's it's uh, the region of the world where there is most strong anti-Americanism, I think, except obviously well, in the well, case I, of Israel. I mean, Israel clearly wants them. are more afraid of the Iranians and ISIS than they are 
of the US presence, even if they don't like necessarily... No, I think that's completely exaggerated. I think the elites of the Gulf certainly want to be America's ally and friend, and that's why part of some of them are using, joined this coalition of the willing. But I mean, one of the things in the Arab Spring was precisely to get away from dictatorships which were clients of the United States. That, that element of the Arab Spring, which was about foreign policy, is often underplayed. But that was clear in Tunisia, where France was the colonial power more than the US, but in Egypt it was certainly the colonial power, seen as a neo-colonial power, and people wanted to get away from that. Jordan, of course, is uh, perhaps a bit different, but Israel wants America. But most countries are very suspicious. I mean, after all, the US has been intervening in the Middle East for more than 50 years, took over from the British and uh, it's been a disaster for most people in the Middle East. James, you want to add something? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Jonathan on this. Um, I mean, uh, Peter Avery, the Omar Khayyam translator at King's, used to say to me that all these problems go back to the defeat of the Mamluks by Napoleon. The Arab world has been trying to unify itself. The caliphate speech has been going on quite a lot. It was with bin Laden in the beginning. And there are movements like that. The Pan-Arab Revolution in Algeria was going on in the early 19th century. The British imposed their structures there, structures that have not been able to be maintained by anybody, really. And these experiments in trying to restore the caliphate have been hugely enhanced by America's interference in the region, getting involved with elites, rather like the ones in Latin America. We seem to do this over and over, even in Ukraine somehow, we've gotten into this kind of role. And what it's actually doing is it's, it's perfecting a laboratory in which this experiment of unifying militant Islam from Indonesia to Morocco, prospering. You know? I mean, the ISIS has really got the formula quite right. I mean, they're getting much, much closer to being able to find an ideology within Islam as brutal and ghastly as it is, which will more or less erase all our, what we would call, I would say, our American allies in that region, what there are of them. And I don't think really any of the Arab governments down there really want us there, and except to you know, get something out of us if they do maintain their position in power. So I, I no, I, I agree with you, Jonathan. I don't know who in Arabia really wants the Americans. Perhaps the Iranians, the beginning before Ahmadinejad was elected, when Cairo's speech was made, maybe then the Iranians would have cooperated. They would have wanted to be part of something with America. You are listening to The Voice of Russia in London, and taking part in this conversation are Mahdi Darius Nezamroaya, a research associate at the Center for Research on Globalization down the line from Canada, Jonathan Steele, The Guardian newspaper and author of several books here in the studio in London, James Thacker, a novelist and human rights activist also in the studio in London, and down the line Anatole Levin, professor of King's College London and currently in Qatar. Closer to home for the voice of Russia, Ukraine. Jonathan Steele, I would like to address this to you. You've um, written a book about several interventions in Afghanistan, where you compared the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan with the later invasion by NATO, US-led coalition. The Soviet invasion in Afghanistan, was that uh, provoked by the West. Is that a safe assumption now? There was an element of provocation, but I think it was it was this idea that um, the US was going to encroach on the Soviet Union from the South. Don't forget that in February 1979, the Shah, the great bastion of American power in the Middle East, collapsed and was thrown out and in came Khomeini. And there was this funny feeling that somehow in Moscow that Khomeini would move Iran back to the Americans, and that in Afghanistan, the Hafizullah Amin, who was the current leader, would also move back to the Americans. And uh, they moved preemptively, uh, stupidly, into Kabul to try and overthrow, overthrow that regime and put in a client puppet regime in, in Kabul. So I think it, was, it wasn't expansionist. You know, some people in the West, uh, including uh, Spinev Brzezinski and so on, said they were trying to move to the warm water ports of uh, Pakistan and so on and, uh, and come through Afghanistan to get there. I thought that was nonsense. I think it was kind of defensive move, if you can call an aggression defensive, to preempt something worse happening in Afghanistan, which was it falling out totally from the non-aligned camp into an American camp. Anatole Levin, um, you have also written on the region extensively. Is that your reading of the situation? Yes, though as Brzezinski himself has admitted, there was an element of deliberate provocation on the US side, even you know before 
the Soviet um, invasion of Afghanistan. But I think Jonathan is absolutely right on that. It was a, a classic attempt to prop up a client regime, fearing that its fall would lead to, to wider and very dangerous consequences. In that, of course, it's pretty close to things that America and previous imperial powers did, America in, in South Vietnam and so forth. Uh, of course, that, as Jonathan has said, doesn't make it any less of a mistake on the Soviet part. Mahdi, are we seeing any similarities with Ukraine here? Well, yes, we are. Uh, there's so many things that I would have loved to, uh, to talk about. I've been making notes, as the other panelists have been speaking about. Before I answer that, let me very briefly, quickly point something out. When we talk about American influence, we can argue about terms, but we have to look at what we, someone means when they say American influence. So, for example, when we hear Hillary Clinton speaking on the media front, saying the United States needs to expend more on uh, things like Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. So American influence can increase in other places. What does it mean? That's a question we should keep in, in, in mind, okay? And in regards to uh, this entire question of dominance, we have to remember that perception management uh, is something the United States is very good at. And people might perceive that their lives might become better, or might perceive that China is a threat now, or might perceive that Russia is a threat, but that doesn't mean that's reality. And we have to ask where the uh, constructs for these perceptions are coming from. And that's one. Of, this actually goes full circle to things like statements like Hillary Clinton saying we should prop up our media like Radio Free Europe because our enemies are winning the war. And what's this war? It's on this perception management. But in regards to Ukraine, absolutely. Uh, I'd like to categorically state that Mr. Brzezinski, in an interview with the French press, said, yes, we were behind the invasion of Afghanistan and the Soviets fell for it. Those aren't my words. If you want to disagree, that's fine. But those are Mr. Uh, Mr. Brzezinski's own words that you can read in the French press. It's very famous. So, yes, they pushed the Soviets into Afghanistan. And one of the fears that the Soviets had was that the Muslims in the South, which is something the Americans were always pushing uh, to, to basically weaponize the Muslim populations in the Soviet South, you know, in places like Kazakhstan and the Caucasus, and as well as using Afghanistan as a base for that. And, and you know what? The Americans have been working on that. And when I mean the Americans, not the American people, the United States government, so Washington. And yes, foreign policy elites. I'm glad one of the panelists brought up foreign policy elites, because this goes to your question about how Ukraine is like Afghanistan. Well, I'm in Canada, as you said, down in line in, in Canada, and in Halifax, there's something called the International Halifax Security Forum. This security forum is, uh, was started by the German Marshall Fund, which is based in Washington, D.C. It was funded by them and by the Canadian government uh, here, Stephen Harper, the Conservatives, who actually, some of the funding, I think it's very illegal because they used a development fund for uh, local development to fund this security forum. Okay, this security forum started in 2009. One of the first guests was the foreign policy advisor of Mr. Yatsenyuk. And this policy, uh, this forum was about expanding NATO. One of the speakers was talking about war with Iran. And there's, a, there's something the United States is working on is creating a consensus amongst elites all around the world. And in fact, they've made similar security forums in Ukraine. For years, they've spent money in Ukraine to basically groom elites to think your interests lie with the United States, not with the Russian Federation or not with the Commonwealth of Independent States, which is where the majority of your trade is. Uh, you know, 80% about of their trade is, not, is with Belarus, Russia, Kazakhstan. Um, so they groomed this, and, and this entire situation in Kiev, it's been manufactured by the United States. I mean, uh, Thank you, thank you, Mahdi. Uh, I want to give the mic to James Thackeray. Uh, Mahdi's certainly right about the Afghan situation. But I'd like to frame things slightly differently about the uh, border uh, between Ukraine and Russia. Um, America, as it emerged from the Cold War, um, um, I watched Russian dissidents being disappointed. I watched the uh, Harvard economists uh, betray the privatization program. I now see them climbing all over Putin over this business of uh, Ukraine, which, uh, you know, I mean, historically, there are plenty of justifications. I mean, you can argue that ad, ad infinitum. But the fact is, and that the, she, the head of the Chinese government, has said it, Russian officials have said it, 
America's exceptionalism is this idea that America is the is the only country somehow that's the only superpower. I'm afraid that China and Russia, Russia the largest country in the world, and China is has since the first, before the first opium war had the largest economy in the world and certainly will have it now. Um, these three countries are going to have to get along together. And I think in a way, on a psychological level, what Putin was trying to do with this border, he was trying to say, look, you've just invaded two countries, killed a million people, you, are, you have military all over the place, we all have to participate in this business of protecting our borders and dealing with uh, our peoples and with our national pride. And I think that's why Putin has scored a huge success with his polls in, in Russia right now. And I think, I hope that Americans are taking this. In a sense, Putin was holding his mirror up to America and saying, look, we're all going to have to do this together. And I think the problem we've got is not with Obama, it's not with his speech at the, uh, at the United Nations, it's with this huge security operation. And, you know, the Republicans are doing their very, very best to keep that there. I think they probably thought Romney would take over again and run that whole thing and continue with their imperial ambitions. But that has to stop. And I don't think the American people want it. I don't think the Chinese want it. I don't think the Russians want it. So I think we have to get along at this point. Well, that's um, something, Anatole, even you postulated in one of your recent articles. Um, can America actually afford to prop up this claim to domination, to be all over the globe at the same time? No, I, I think it will bankrupt itself in the process. Um, and I think it will ultimately stir up, you know, so many enemies against itself um, that uh, it will, at best, uh, eventually um you know, be, be forced to, to withdraw as previous empires did, and at worst will actually stumble, you know, into a, uh, a very serious conflict, possibly a catastrophic conflict mm -hmm. in the Far East. Because um, although I, I, I entirely agree that, you, you know, um, Putin, the Chinese leadership, others too, including democratic governments, uh, have been saying that, you know, America simply has to get on with other major powers, even if they do not share uh, America's ideology. Uh, this is something which the American establishment at heart finds very difficult to do. I mean, a striking thing is that Wolfowitz's famous memorandum, secret memorandum, which was leaked of 1992 under the first Bush administration, saying that, uh, you know, essentially America should prevent um, the existence of great powers anywhere in the world. In other words, America must be unilaterally dominant everywhere. Now, at the time, that was uh, extremely widely uh, criticized uh, in America and indeed disowned by the administration of Bush the father. Uh, but the striking thing is, and with a, you know, a bipartisan consensus behind it, that to a great extent this has become the modus operandi of, uh, of U.S. policy since then uh, under the Clinton administration, the Bush administration, and admittedly, once again, in a softer and more cautious way, the Obama administration. Hence, you know, the, um, the, the move into Ukraine, hence the, the moves to contain China. Uh, so, um, I, I mean, I, I've, I've argued for many, many years about um, America's need, you know, to recognize the legitimacy of other people's interests, um, the need for cooperation uh, across ideological lines against, you know, the terror range of threats facing humanity. Um, I must say over the years I've also become less and less optimistic on the subject. But um, I would however like, like to come back once again and say that um, you know this America, uh, America's position because um, if, if you look at India say they certainly would never accept American dominance but as we see from Modi's visit to Washington you know uh, India after all is the second largest country in the world in terms of population and certainly the Indian policy elites while they will never accept American dominance are uh, very strongly supportive of an American presence in Asia, once again, um, against their, uh, you know, what they see as their major rival, China, and major threat, Pakistan. Now, once again, this is not about democracy, whatever the Indian and American governments may say. It's about national interests. But, um, you know, they, this is a, a, um, a, a strong position uh, among many members of the Indian policy elites. Not acceptance of dominance, uh, but um, belief in an American alliance.
So, uh, using America as a tool to to keep the balance in the in the region or all over the globe. And Jonathan Steele, please do jump in. Well, I think there's still a big question mark in my mind, and I haven't yet seen any good answer to it, is why the Americans have revived this Cold War against Russia. I mean, the earlier part of Obama's second term was the pivot towards Asia and, you know, this attempt to contain China, which I think they're over-exaggerating anyway. You know, they're, they're exaggerating the alleged threat from China, but nevertheless, there is this great bush in East Asia. Then you've got the whole Islamic thing, the complete turbulence in the Middle East now because ISIS, why do they suddenly need a third front, as it were, uh, which they've developed just in the last six months as a result of Ukraine to revive the Cold War? It doesn't seem to make any sense because, I mean, Russia is not the equal of the United States in the world. It's no longer a global power, it's a regional power, it has no big and ambitions. And not really a challenge. And not to, a challenge, it's not, it's no attempt to, to, to recreate the Soviet empire, let alone yeah, a global yeah, empire, yeah. and yet the Americans, sometimes you feel that Obama's almost like a prisoner in the White House, that there's a combination of the neocons mm -hmm. from the Bush administration who are still there, plus these humanitarian interventionists like Samantha Bauer and Susan Rice who are there in other capacities, and that Obama is the only one who's trying to keep a sort of even keel, but he's always outsmarted by his advisors. Yes, we ought to, and when I can, mentioned can I foreign... Jump? Sorry. Can can I jump in there quickly? Um, I, I entirely agree, but I, I would answer that it is precisely the way in which the wolf of its doctrine, if you can call it that, has become American doctrine. Nobody else is to exert influ you know, influence beyond their borders, essentially, uh, in any part of the world, except when America sees it as completely in tune with its interests. But the other thing, Jonathan, you, as I'm sure you know, uh, you know why, uh, and you're quite right, this is in no way you know, in the deeper interests of the United States states, let alone humanity. Uh, but the answer is that the Washington policy elites are also not wholly rational. Um, they are also influenced by very strong prejudices, emotions, affections, um, and uh, also, I'm sorry to say, hatreds mm. in many cases. Uh, precisely the mixture, by the way, which George Washington, the first president, warned against in his farewell address. Uh, but um, rationality has a hard time often prevailing against this mixture of factors. Thank you, Anatole. And James, yes. Can I just add to that about our foreign policy that, yes, you're absolutely right, Anatole. Uh, the country was built by English and Dutch, and um, those racial prejudices, the Brookline Country Club and Boston Jews are not allowed still. These hatreds and internal resentments, which come up against this issue of America being a melting pot, the progressive aspect of America, the melting pot, the world looks to that and they say, if we could but have this melting pot, how much easier things would be. It's a very, very progressive society. But the ruling elite which is an amateur elite. These people in Washington, who I've often seen, these are people very often who don't know very much. We have, and this is what I find so scary. Let's not accuse Obama. Let's be terrified of this extraordinarily ignorant, ill-tutored bunch of special interest people who will bow to all sorts of pressures and whatever. And this thing is constantly evolving, and the world looks at it, and they would like them to come and speak to them, but they can't speak to them, but they're not articulate. They do not have foreign policy. The mothball fleet of the Cold War warriors, which I belong to, um, um, have been paraded out in the lack of any other substitute as a policy. Now, Marty, in one of your publications, um, if I remember correctly, uh, you had this map of Russia partitioned. Um, now, this picture of this map of Russia is an illustration to the concept that that is the design of the opposing power, in this case, the United States and NATO. Now, this map may look as a conspiracy theory. Is it, Mahdi? Well, sure, it is a conspiracy. Uh, it's, uh, somebody's conspiring to divide Russia in their heads, of course. Uh, the, but this map was also published by Radio Free Europe, the Ukrainian uh, state. It's basically state media of the United States. Radio Free Europe, let's be very clear, is state media. People will say it's, it's U.S. CIA. Media. You can use the, no, not CIA. It is CIA. It's Clinton funny, tried to get it out. Uh, well, sure. I'm, uh, look, I'm saying the U.S. government funds Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, and they're the ones who publish this in Europe. And this was put up, by, written by Ukrainian activists. My question here, that I, that I, or my, my thesis here is, where are these ideas coming from? You know, Mr. Brzezinski himself said that it's better if Russia is divided into several countries. 
it, it would be more democratic for the Russians if their country was split up. And who supports separatists in Chechnya? I mean, uh, I don't think the Cold War, going back to what one of the panels said, this new Cold War, I don't think the Cold War ever ended because when a country uh, or an elite like the ones in Washington, the Washington Beltway, want to control everything in the world or have influence, as some people might want to use the term influence instead of uh, control, well, of course you want everyone else weaker. And, and why do we see... Uh, uh, consistently, countries in other parts of the world that are always opposed to the United States, consistently th them breaking up, like Yugoslavia. You know, it was neutral, actually. It wasn't even in the Soviet camp. It wasn't the Western bloc broken up. Uh, Soviet Union, uh, you see Arab countries, instead of becoming more unified, are becoming more fragmented in, uh, whenever the United States intervenes. Now, some people will say, well, you can look at Spain, you can look what's happening in Scotland. But Look at how differently those processes are happening in places, or like in Belgium, where there's calls for Fla the uh, Flemish and the uh, to break okay, away. Okay, but Marty, um, thank you. Well, this is essentially the question, and that's probably the crux of the matter. We're talking about the balkanization of the Middle East, but we're talking about balkanization of the world, aren't we? Anatole Levin. Sure. Well, I mean, uh, no, uh, I mean, the world is balkanized already. Um, you know, it didn't take the United States to balkanize the world. Uh, you know, if you look at the, the situation in East Asia, in the Middle East, yes. I mean, the, uh, the Middle East was originally balkanized, if you like, by Britain and France after the First World War. Um, the U.S. has done nothing to de-balkanize it. But I would caution against thinking that there is some you know, wicked, detailed master plan in Washington. You know, this map idea, the Pakistanis um, raise it as well, because frankly, one half-crazed lieutenant, retired lieutenant colonel published such a map for the breakup of Pakistan, and, and one, you, you know, extreme Republican congressman took it up. Um, this is not the program of the United uh, States policy. Hold on, Joe Biden also, I'm, I'm sorry, but Joe Biden also agreed with dividing Iraq. It's called the Biden Plan. You have the New York Times, the, uh, the Wilsonian no, 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 Center that was, I'm publishing sorry, really, map. The, the, the plan for the division of Iraq was a... Con now, uh, yes, I mean, it was the U.S. invasion that brought about... The Israelis uh, were the exactly saying this civil for war. decades. Would you uh, let me finish? Marty, please? sorry, the yes. The U.S. invasion brought about the civil war. Uh, that divided Iraq. The Biden plan was an attempt to get out while leaving, you know, some sort of minimal order behind. The United States did not invade Iraq with the intention of dividing the place. You mustn't work backwards from events, you know, to, to, to invent um, detailed uh, plans for them. A lot of the time, the, the United States elites are just, as with this case of ISIS, scrambling uh, to respond to events that they were not prepared for and do not understand. Um, as we've heard, many of them are actually, even the, the so-called foreign policy elites, are actually profoundly ignorant uh, of the rest of the world um, and of, certainly of, of details of situations. The problem is that they are programmed ideologically um, to, to, to respond in certain ways. And one, you know, the key factor from this point of view is to this belief that, yes, uh, America has the right and duty uh, to lead and, when necessary, to force other people to follow it. And essentially, nobody has the right to object to that. Um, but, you know, th this is uh, very often a, a you know, an essentially confused response rather than a cold-blooded, highly intelligent master plan. Um, if you look at so many of the people in Washington, uh, they, they are not, in fact, super intelligent, nor actually are they cold-blooded. They are responding very emotionally to, to events on the ground. An example of that being with Iraq, they forgot before they left the Ba'ath Party in place after the first Gulf War. And sometime between the first Gulf War and the second, they forgot that they were trying to keep the Shias out of there. And they implemented the Shia takeover of Iraq, one of the classic mistakes of history. So that's not a grand master plan. I agree with you, Anatole. Talking about improvisation, all right, the events in Ukraine, again, I want to sort of um, round out with that. Uh, Jonathan Steele, uh, you were watching the events, well, starting probably before November last year. Was that improvisation on all sides? 
I think there's been a plan to try and get Ukraine into NATO for the last 10 years. And they've been working very hard. And uh, James, I think, was quite right saying there are these people who are grooming the elites, uh, grooming particularly the Ukrainian elite, you know, the National Democratic Institute or whatever it's called, the Democratic Party's foreign policy arm and the same one for the Republicans had offices in Kiev and they were constantly pushing this idea. Dear, inviting people to Washington, inviting them to Brussels, to NATO headquarters, you know, whining and dining them, offering them all kinds of blandishments. Even though every single opinion poll in Ukraine showed the majority of Ukrainians did not want to enter NATO. Um, but they, they, they would not give up and, and, you know, they're slowly moving towards achieving their, their aim. Uh, because now Yatsenyuk uh, and, uh, and Poroshenko are saying they're going to uh, get the parliament to throw out the... Uh, the vote that uh, ratified non-alignment as a strategy, and they're going to then uh, start uh, proceedings to join NATO. So they just uh, have been doing this for 10 years. So in that sense, it wasn't improvisation. Thank you very much. Now, um, I'll finish with a quote um, of a concept of full-spectrum superiority as defined by the U.S. military. They define it as the cumulative effect of dominance in the air, land, maritime, and space domains, and information environment that permits the conduct of joint operations without effective opposition or prohibitive interference. Well, I hope that we've provided some of that in this discussion, and thank you all for taking part. Mahdi Darius Nezam Roaya, Research Associate at the Center for Research on Globalization, Jonathan Steele of The Guardian newspaper and author of several books, James Thackera, novelist and human rights activist, and down the line from Qatar, Anatole Levin, Professor of War Studies, uh, Department of War Studies, King's College London, and now based in Qatar. Thank you all very much. You're listening to The Voice of Russia. (laughs) 